Hello and welcome to the Cube live from the AWS studios in Seattle. We're really unpacking what's going on, as specifically around networking and cloud computing and some of the resilience and data transfer that's going on in here. And I, I think I couldn't ask for two better people to come on board with me to really unpack this. I got Rob Kennedy, who's the VP of Global Connectivity for AWS, and Anoop Dewani, who's the Director of EC2 Networking Product Management. Thanks for coming on board, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So I think that, you know, again, you guys have been making some great announcements in this space. Earlier this year, you really talked about data transfer out to the internet and really how it helped organizations that wanted to, if they were going to fully move out of AWS. What are you hearing from customers about this and how do they understand DTO and the costs of that? Well, honestly, uh, we haven't heard uh, much from customers in terms of moving out of AWS uh, and data transfer as a big blocker or barrier. Uh, in fact, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, we just really wanted to get rid of the misinformation that's out there that, that says there is a barrier. And so earlier this year, we basically made it free for any customer to move all of their data out of AWS at zero cost. Yeah, I, I think... Again, there was a whole bunch of people who were announcing, hey, you, you, if you're going to leave, we'll, we'll make it free for you. And I, I think, again, uh, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, again, people want their data back, they can get it back, which I, I think always was an AWS thing. It's your data, you own it kind of thing. So a new, really, some of the recent news coverage around repatriation, uh, what have you been seeing? Because uh, people are, you know, saying, hey, it's due to cost and things of that nature. What are you seeing in the report? Um, I, um, based on even the, the data transfer out that we made it free, uh, I don't think we have seen anybody moving out uh, of the cloud. In fact, I see the trend in the opposite way. Um, there are just too many examples, but, um, you know, we, for instance, there's a company called Fortem. They are a healthcare company. Um, they they operate in 50 countries, and they just very recently uh, migrated their transit backbone network over to AWS uh, using a service called AWS CloudBan. Um, and by doing so, uh, they, they they kind of retired all their on-premises hardware, simplified their network architecture, and um, in in this process, realized 70% cost savings in their network transit service cost. So um, these are some of the examples. Another great example is Capital One. They I think in 2020, they migrated all their data centers to AWS. Um, I think they became the first cloud, uh, a U.S. bank that uh, to be all in the cloud, and they've been actually scaling pretty well and reaping benefit of cloud. I think it's also important to uh, to highlight uh, some real facts as well. Ever since we've released that free offering to move out, I can count the number of customers on a single hand that have actually executed against that. That's pretty good. I mean, I, I think, again, it's good to have that option, but... Yeah, and I, I, I think the primary reason that we hear from customers where they appreciate, um, you know, cloud environment, specifically AWS's uh, reliability and scalability that they get uh, with, with our, you know, infrastructure. That's what keep them, you know, in grow and actually scale their infrastructure on, on AWS. Yeah, no, I mean, that totally makes sense. And I, I think really some of the other things that AWS has always done is really been about lowering prices, even though back in the days when I was here, again, it was always a function of how you could bring things down over time as you got to scale. What other things do you see that you're helping customers from both of you that really lower their IT costs? Well, generally, if you think about data transfer out, uh, last year, we actually introduced a uh, significantly uh, larger free tier for customers. Uh a tier that essentially allows over 94% of our customers to pay $0 every month uh, for data transfer. Um, so really, you know, all customers gain the benefit of that. That's kind of something that we've been able to uh, institute because of all the investments that we continually make uh, in our network uh, over the years. So uh, that I think has gone down pretty well with, with customers. And that and that's for them just normal and normal out. Normal doesn't matter where they're sending their data on the internet. Uh, they get 100 gigabytes free every single month, uh, and that covers 94% of our customers. So maybe they're you know 
bringing data somewhere else to do some other processing on it and bringing it back and doing... Or they could have web-facing applications to customers, uh, they'd be serving websites. You know, so again, smaller companies who have, you know, websites out there on the internet and they want to put them on, uh, on AWS, uh, they can also, uh, use our, uh, CDN service called CloudFront and they get a terabyte free, uh, every month, uh, for that uh, service, which gives them low latency across the entire globe to, uh, to users. Yeah. No, I, I think that to me is one of the things that people don't understand is that you, you, it's a looking at how applications are actually architected they're not all in one place typically especially if they're uh you know open to the public or on the internet or something of that nature a customer facing application to an end device or something like that but anoop let's come kind of back to what you kind of you know mentioned briefly there around scalability and reliability and really how you're designing it into the actual cloud infrastructure and what that critical choice is that you're making. Yeah, um, there are, so so I I personally believe that, uh, you know, we've designed, a, designed and built AWS to be the most scalable and reliable cloud computing environment. Uh, and one of the key enabler of that is our network. We also do sweat a lot of small stuff, um, how, how to have everything redundant so there's no, you know, a single point of failures. And then we actually build in reliability into our, networking services as well, like um, my team um, owns around or is responsible for around 20 plus AWS services in networking. And, you know, the, the software architecture that we have, they, they, they are, the reliability and, and, and resilience is kind of built into that architecture. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's stay with that for a second mm -hmm. and understand because I, I think to me, a lot of times people look at cloud computing and high availability and networking and, and networking sometimes seems like the hardest part for them. Yeah. How are you making that easy for customers? And how, because you're, you're talking like five different availability zones. Yeah. Some of the services stretch over those availability zones. Sometimes the customers are building their own HA on top of that. And obviously network plays a different, how are you helping customers? Right. So, so uh, reliability and availability should be at multiple layers. So first is the physical infrastructure. As I talked about, our AZ design um, is by nature, it is everything is fully redundant, fault tolerant. So, yeah, I think it's yeah. important to, to point out like AWS takes it from the physical ground all the way up. Yeah. Uh, unlike many others. And that, that means like we're purchasing the land, we're building the physical concrete, uh, all of the power infrastructure, the cooling is our own technology. Uh, and that really allows us to do unique things in the data center, the physical environment, just in those buildings itself. And then as Anoop was saying, like all of our availability zones, they're geographically dispersed uh, to ensure that some local event, whether it be, uh, you know, some kind of natural disaster, a fire, some electrical substation were to go out, all of those things are protected against and independent uh, with availability zones. So that gives this foundation that then allows our software to be built and utilize that as well, so. Yeah, um, so the software, the services that we offer, uh, uh, a lot of networking services that uh, we offer are software-defined uh, networking services. Things like Transit Gateway, Private Link, NAT Gateway. These are the products that customers use to build reliable architecture on top of us. Um, and they are all kind of built uh, with two basic principles, uh, one is, called Availability Zone Independence, or AZI that we call it, and another is Static Stability. Um, let me kind of explain what those these terms mean. So every service that runs on a region, um, uh, they are avail Availability Zone Independent, right? So AZI. What, what that means is that these services are actually running in each AZ, independent of each other, um, and so that if something were to happen in one AZ, the, the service doesn't go down. Uh, for example, uh, Transit Gateway is a great example. It's a regional router the, that we offer in a region that allow customers to connect their VPCs, those VPCs back to on-premises network through Direct Connect. Uh, it's a regional construct, but it runs, uh, its component are zonal. So, and so that if anything were to happen in one of the AZ, the service still stays up. Um, another very important concept that actually our services are built with is called static stability. Uh, what that means is that uh, even if some software issue happened, uh, the, the system is designed to actually continue 
in the face of failure as well. So statistically, what we have seen is our control plane uh, at our scale can fail uh, more frequently than, say, data plane. So we design our system around that, and um, all these services, Transit Gateway, um, NAT Gateway, Private Link, they are built with data planes so that once the data plane is programmed, it doesn't need a control plane. It continues to operate, and that is why customer actually gain get that reliability and availability on which they build their own infrastructure on top of it. I think a good example, by the way, just as you think about kind of a software service, right? Uh, a lot of times you're going to have to make some code changes to that software service, right? And what we what we mean by things like availability zone independence is when you go make those software changes, each one of those software stacks are independent in each availability zone. So you're never going to change the software in multiple availability zones at the same time, which then gives, you know, guarantees the customers who want to go and, and deploy high available architectures that they can be in a guaranteed spot that they're not going to see that impact across multiple AZs. And that goes as well for our regions as well, like our regions, which are made up of multi-availability zones, are completely independent from other regions as well. Uh, and so again, customers can uh, live in that, that good mindset that they've got that kind of separation, which happens in all of our operations, happens in all of our software deployments uh, globally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's key. When we've heard of people, you know, having incidents of that where maybe they didn't try it in something like a Canaries zone or something like that. And didn't have availability zones and it, you kind of have a rolling outage that would, yeah. you know, takes down a particular service or something like that. But you, you brought up a good point here, which is it's not only just about the availability zones, it is about the regions because I may have used two availability zones in one region and I may use another region and another, a third availability zone in a, in a second region. How, how do you make that easy for customers from a networking perspective as well? Oh, well, first of all, uh, just in the underlying infrastructure, you know, we build, again, everything is ground up owned by AWS. So there is a private network that connects all of our locations within a region uh, and then connects all of those regions with all of the other regions around the globe. That is a private backbone that is owned and operated by AWS. Uh, the fi from the fiber in the ground to the equipment that we run on top of that fiber, uh, we're running our own network stack from top to bottom, which I mean really gives us control around things like cost, availability. And so we can build a huge amount of durability into the into the end-to-end -end system. And then we make that connectivity super easy, uh, especially with a whole bunch of uh, network services that uh, Anupra. Yeah. Uh, so we often see our customers deploy their workloads across multiple availability zone or across multiple region. And, and we do have multiple products um, that customers use to actually connect these these workloads. So they'll in a region they might have thousands of VPCs. They use Transit Gateway for that. Um, if they need, um, you know, as I was talking about Fortiv as one of the customers, where they they run in fifty countries, so they they are across multiple regions. They use uh, things like AWS CloudVan, where they can actually connect all these footprints with one single global network running on top of AWS Backbone. Um, if you don't, if you want to access a SaaS service or AWS service, and you don't want to go over internet. We have products like Private Link that offers you to have connectivity over our own private network. So there are a lot of such products. As I mentioned, there are around 20 plus products in, in, in our EC2 networking portfolio that customers find it useful to build uh, a custom architecture of their own. Yeah, and you even have those those private links also work with some of the partners who are out there. Absolutely. The community yeah. As well. Yeah. Right. We have, uh, we have uh, over 200 uh, private links support over 200 AWS services and uh, many, many ISV partners who actually offer their services through Private Link. Yeah, no, I, I think that is one of the really interesting things because I think that opens up the ecosystem and I think probably why you're not seeing a lot of DTO and counting it on one hand kind of thing. But let's kind of circle back to one of the big elephants that's been talked about and th probably thrown at you all the time, but the elephant in the room about you know egress charges and how expensive egress is from an AWS perspective. Yep. Um, yeah, first of all, we don't uh, talk about it as egress charges. Uh, we specifically call it data transfer out for a good reason. When you say egress charges, a lot of people have the misconception that that is, hey, we've only just got cost at the edge of our network where we're handing off to some other, other network or provider. But the reality is that's not the majority of our cost. 
Uh, our cost is built up from the time that a packet wants to go and leave an AWS availability zone uh, and it gets carried all over, over our global infrastructure to the right endpoint to go and burn that off to. Uh, and there's many ways you can build a network. You can build a network uh, that is cheap without a lot of reliability, um, doesn't have a lot of availability, doesn't have kind of performance, doesn't scale very well. Uh, or you could take a different tact, uh, which is we understand that our customers' data is super important uh, and needs to be protected at all times. Uh, and so we have built uh, a global network that has huge amounts of availability uh, in it, uh, built into withstand multiple overlapping, completely diverse failures. Uh, we take all of those failure models and we ensure that we can carry the peak traffic load at all times. Uh, we, we have automated forecasting systems that essentially tell us where we need to go and, and, and ensure that we're aggressive in terms of putting the capacity into the ground so customers can enjoy that elasticity as well. Uh, and all of that network is 100% secure. Uh, it's all encrypted with max encryption. Uh, every single uh, building that you leave that is an AWS building will basically have that kind of encryption on it because you're leaving our, our uh, physical security controls. Um, and then we optimize the performance on that network as well. And, and we have, you know, some of the most sensitive customers out there and they continue to push us to uh, continue to improve uh, that performance uh, over time. Uh, and again, all of that takes investments. As I said, we own the hardware, we own the fiber, we own the operating system. There's a lot of investments that go in there. And so there is uh, some real substantial cost, but for that cost, you get, uh, you know, an amazing service at the end of the day as well. No, I, I think that to me is a great place to leave it. I, I think that you guys really have kind of uh, gotten at some stuff that I, I think people are really interested in digging into because, you know, again, it's not common to be uh, talking about the elephants in the room and, and things like that. So I appreciate you coming on board and uh, talking through that. Cool. Yeah. I love to talk about this stuff. So thank you. Uh, well, I'm sure we will. I'm sure, you know, with reInvent right around the corner, I'm sure we'll get to talk more. So yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching this episode of The Cube live from the AWS studios here in Seattle. Stay tuned. We have more coming for you. We'll be right back.